If your Bible's open, please, to Psalm chapter 27 tonight. I am preaching two messages out of this psalm. One was last Sunday night where I challenged us on having the uh, praise toward God. But there's another concept in the psalm that I mentioned we would talk about this Sunday night that has found each of these psalms from the, from the last few from the, psalm of, from the writer of David. I have named a particular attribute or named Jesus or God in them. And this one is no different. Now, this one we'll find in the very first verse, I believe, the concept for what David wants to communicate through the power of the Holy Spirit in this psalm. Something that we all need help with. Something that we all will struggle with. Something that we all will face on a regular basis. You see, there are some truths in Scripture that would be those moment of decision truths. Salvation is one such truth, where you have to one time choose Jesus Christ. But there are other decisions and other things in Scripture that that we need all day, every day. We need it when we wake up, we need it when we drive to work, when we get off work, when we're in work. We need it with our kids, with our spouse, we need it in every situation. This is one of those truths right here in Psalm chapter 27. One that I hope will be a help to you. I know that from the word of God, that God's word will be a help to you. But look, please, in verse 1 of Psalm 27, where David writes these words, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Look at the next phrase, please. Now, I'll leave a blank and please fill in the blank when I get there. The Lord is the... of my life. The Lord is the what? Strength of my life. Tonight, the question, the provoking question that I will ask you to think about and contemplate, if you get nothing else, think about this question. Is God the strength of your life? Sometimes God is the strength of my problems, but not the strength of my life. Those are two different things. Sometimes I just run back to God when life isn't going well, but when life is going well, well, God gets shoved aside. He's not the strength of my life. He's the strength of, of problems. The problem may be financial. The problem may be health. The problem may be in a relationship or with a wayward child. The problem may be with a parent and a destroyed issue there. It may be at work with a coworker, with a boss. With a subordinate. The problem may be physical. My house may have a problem. My car or other such problem like that. And those times we run back to God. But God doesn't want to just be the God of our problems. Though the scripture is filled with times that God delivers us and rescues us in our problems. So don't think that God will leave us high and dry. God promises to help us even when we make a mess of things. And I can't wait to get to Psalm 34 because that's where God goes through that. And David's in a mess that he made himself and God still helps him out. He doesn't leave you high and dry just to face it. He'll help you if you call on him. But God doesn't just want to be the God of problems. When the, to- when the planes crashed in the towers on 9-11 in 2001... Someone here weren't alive. I was in college at that time. My mom said to me then, you'll never forget where you're at. It's like when JFK was assassinated. I was not alive when JFK was assassinated. And those who were probably remember right where you were at when you heard the news. But I remember where I was at when I heard about 9-11. I also remember going to New York City just a few months later. Within the year, I was in New York City. And at Ground Zero around that time, they were, still, uh, they were still moving things. There was still just a mess around there. The city in that part was strangely quiet. If you've been in New York City, you know that that city is, they've called the city that never sleeps, and it's always going, but that spot around Ground Zero right there was was strangely quiet. But in that city that has rejected God, New York City is not a place where people would run to to find out about what God's will is, and they wouldn't go there saying, boy, all the greatest Christians are in New York City, though there are some great Christians in New York City. We would say that New York City, by and large, would be a place that has pushed God out of the city life and out of the public square there. In that pagan city, focused on hedonism and pleasure and money and self, in that pagan city, after 9-11, there was a powerful prayer vigil. 
You see, when problems hit, people run back to God. Even those who don't normally claim his name want to run back to him. And they'll ask us who claim the name of Jesus to pray for them. And God does help when we have problems. But my friends, tonight the question is, is God, is the Lord the strength, not just in problems, but in your life? And tonight in this passage of Scripture, we're going to look at three problems that plague us through life and then a solution at the end of the chapter. Let's ask God's blessing and help tonight. Lord, I pray that you would touch us tonight. Lord, I'd ask that you would help me to speak a truth in a way that would magnify your word and your character. And Lord, I pray that you would take your truth and cut us deep within. You've promised that your word is quick and powerful. It is sharper than a sword. It pierces, Lord, to our thoughts, to our intentions, to our motives. Lord, tonight I'm asking that your word do just that that we would be good soil, that we would listen, and that everything that you wish to accomplish in this service would be accomplished, that our hearts would be turned towards you, that we'd respond to you. Lord, help us tonight. Meet with us. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Is the Lord the strength of your life? Or is five-hour energy the strength of your life? Is a Red Bull, coffee, chocolate, sleeping in, vacation, time away, what helps you get through life? If the answer is not the Lord, this message is for you. The fact is, many things pull at us. The cares of the day, the stresses of work will pull at us. And yet time and time again, God offers a legitimate offer to supply all our needs. And that doesn't just mean the physical needs where we have a bill. It means the emotional and the stamina and the strength and the wisdom. God desires to be the strength of our life. That means on Monday, God can give us strength. To not just survive the day, not just survive the first day of school tomorrow, young people, but to have a profitable day and a prosperous day, because that's how God gives strength. Have you ever not slept well, fitful sleep, or whatever reason, maybe you had to work late, or you had a project, or whatnot, and fill in the blank of what caused you to stay up late? But you knew that the next day, whether it's a Monday or a Wednesday, you knew that you had a lot to do. And you got up at the time you had to get up, and you felt on top of the world. You're like, man, this is great. I need to sleep less in life. Man, I'm, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm just swinging away up here. I'm just, my mind's going. Man, I feel like decisions are going. Man. And then you crash. And as high as you were up here, as, as low as you get down here, God wants to be the strength of your life. In this passage, David is going to give us three ways that God assisted and was his strength in his life. If you look, we find the first one in verse number one. The Lord is, the light, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now this morning, we also talked about fear in the service. And tonight in the service, we're going to talk about fear again. It's in both sets of passages. Both sermon notes have fear. Why? I don't know, but that's where we're at right now. I would have spaced it out further, but God has us right here again. Fear destroys my faith. Fear holds me hostage. Fear binds me in indecision. Fear sabotages my decisions and my walk in life. Fear hinders the gospel and the transforming process in my life. Fear is a terrible, terrible problem that God's strength can help me overcome. And fear strikes in the most unlikely places. There are a number of fears. I forget the exact number of listed fears that someone can be diagnosed with. But they now have it seemingly a fear for everything. From a fear for, from water, to spiders, to a falling sky. 
Fears that would be legitimate, perhaps public speaking. Sometimes people will say, I don't know how you get up there in front pastor and, and do that. I would be afraid. To fear to making the wrong decision. Fear what others will think. My friends, fear will cause you to fall and fear will cause you to fail. But God gives strength in our fear. Now, it is easy and normal to laugh at someone else's fear. I am not afraid of heights. I don't know why I'm made that way. I'm just not. Mark, I don't think you are either, being on, on the roof. Maybe you are on the roof, but a little bit. Not a little bit. I grew up, my dad and I painted some things. I still remember the day that we're painting, and I'm on a 40-foot extension ladder. I'm at the top of the extension ladder, and I'm on like the next to top rung above where you're supposed to be, and I had to paint the gutter, and apparently my dad set me up there. I don't know why, but <laughs> I probably offered. It didn't, didn't bother me in any way, shape, or form. But I'm painting this gutter, and I'm holding on one hand with the gutter. All right, in one hand, painting like this. All right? I went down to the bucket. All of a sudden, the wind from someone on this house caught the ladder and kicked it away from the house. All right? The Lord helped me that day. I grabbed the gutter and pulled this 40-foot ladder back to the house with me on it. My response in those situations, giggle like a little girl. Now, for some people, climbing a 12-foot ladder would be life-changing for you. Right? Your, your, your pants would need changing. You're, you're that afraid of heights. To me, that doesn't make sense to me. Because I can jump up to 40 foot or higher, and it really does not bother me. I'm sure there's a point where I'd be nervous, but it just doesn't bother me. It doesn't make me good or bad. My point is this. I could look at you and be like, 12 feet, that's nothing. I've fallen off a ladder far, higher than that, and I have. All right? But, but it doesn't make me good or bad. It just is. There are going to be things you face in life that will cause you to fear, that may not cause the person next to you to fear. But they're going to be real in your life. The fear will be real. It'll be powerful. And if you're not careful, it'll cause you to fall. It'll cause you to fail. And not just fall physically, but fall spiritually. It'll bind you in indecision. It will paralyze you. It will hinder you. It will stop you. There are people who do not sing in our choir because they're afraid. There are people who do not teach Sunday school at First Baptist Church because they are afraid. There are people who have not handed out a gospel tract or shared the gospel with a coworker or a family member or a friend. And that coworker, that friend, that family member is lost and on their way to hell. And the gospel has not been shared, not because of a lack of concern or love for God, but because of, help me, fear. God strengthens through our fear. The Bible says God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but he gives to us power, love, and a sound mind, a controlled mind. You see, God strengthens through our fear. I've not told this story for a long time, but it was a time that I, and I've not done this much since, but... Um, I rode a horse. Pastor Scott remembers this. He was there that day. I am not a horse person. I don't claim to be a horse person. I, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't like them. I don't love them. I don't desire them. I don't want to ride them. I don't want to pet them. And I don't want to smell them. We're on a mission trip years ago now. This particular pastor had horses. And he loved to ride. And Pastor Scott was there. And my wife was there. And and my wife loves to ride horses. She grew up riding horses. Pastor Scott loves to ride horses, and this pastor loves to ride horses. And J.D. Howells does not like to ride horses. They're bugging me, you want to ride horses? No, I don't want to ride horses. I will stay with Kim, and I'll watch the kids. I don't care. It was like the last day or next to last day of this mission trip, and um, Pastor Scott comes, and he goes, listen, he goes, I want you to jump on this horse. Your wife's over there across the pasture, and would you jump on this horse? And right over there, I had a great time with her. Now look at this horse, and this horse's name was General. The thing about General was that he was a Pony Express horse. He was trained for Pony Express in Canada, 
and they ran these Pony Express races. And if my details are right, Pastor Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, he was a winner. Okay, I didn't want to say but that's right. He was the best of all those races, or best in the world. He was that fast. I don't care about horses. Remember that part of the story. So I get on this horse, and I do not know what I'm doing, and I'm nervous. Now, you know what horse people always say? Horses can sense your fear. No doubt. No, I have no idea what I'm doing. Now, my wife was riding the other horse that was General's girlfriend. She was cross field, cross pasture. And uh, on this horse, and I'm holding the, the reins like some, incorrectly, as everyone's laughing at me, I'm holding this reins like this. Or, okay, I'm not John Wayne, okay? I'll just tell you right now. And, um, and, and he kind of moves and kicks a little bit, and so I kind of tighten up, and I tighten up my heels right against his, his belly. Well, yeah, of course, of course. I didn't want to fall off the horse. I was afraid of falling off the horse. What happened next is, is apparently what I found out at the end of the story was that General was trained to take off for the Pony Express run, not on a command, a verbal command, not on a whip, but on the mere touch of the heels. And that's exactly what he did. He took off across this field, there were bales of hay, growing, running right toward Doreen and the horse, the mare that she was on. And she tells her part of the story, she looks up, and she sees General running across, or galloping across the field. All right, not trotting, not walking, he was galloping across the field. And she's thinking to herself, what is Pastor Scott doing? All right, we're supposed to cool these horses down. Why is he galloping? What is he doing? That's not Pastor Scott. That's my husband. He doesn't know how to ride a horse. What is he doing? <laughs> General runs all the way up to, to the other horse. I forget the mayor's name. And uh, skids to a halt. A screeching halt through no control of J.D. Howard. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. And I'm like... How do you stop this thing? And she's like, you pull back on the reins. So I pulled back on the reins again, and this time General reared up on his back two feet. Thinking I was going to fall off again, I tightened up. And General took back off across the pasture. This time, and I remember this, you know how sometimes life slows down? Life slowed down. I remember just holding on to the saddle for dear life. I remember that General, I looked at it and I saw that the bit in his mouth, he had bit into the front of his mouth at this point. His ears were back, and I felt that he was flying across the field. Pastor Scott tells me later on that he watches General come back across the field. He's worried that General's going to step inside of a, a, a hole uh, and break his leg. But he said, he said, I, I watched this horse gallop and all four feet, all four legs were off the ground. The legs were off the ground. He was in a full-on just run across the field. The best in the world, the fastest Pony Express horse I'm on top of. And I have no idea what I'm doing. He comes in flying into the corral right there. And, uh, of course, Pastor Scott is yelling some whatever like this. He skids to a halt. When he skids to a halt, my heart is racing a thousand miles a minute. He stops. When he stops, apparently whoever put the saddle on this crazed horse had not tightened it, and the saddle falls off, and I fall to the ground. Boom! And there I'm looking up at the underside of this horse, praising God that I'm alive. Sometimes life feels like a Pony Express ride. Sometimes what God calls us to do feels like a full-on gallop in life. You're like, what is going on? Others may be observing, they're like, whoa, that looks scary. And you're like, yeah, it is. Sometimes others will ask, what are you doing? You don't know how to do that. You're right. How do you stop this thing? Fear will stop us in the work of God faster than anything else. The decision in my life is always to either follow my father or fall and fail in my fear. 
And here the psalmist says, The Lord, strengthen my life. Whom shall I fear? Nothing's going to hinder me. No matter what obstacle it may be, whether it's fear of heights or fear of water or horses, God is the strength of my life. Tonight, I don't know what's hindering you, but God wants to be the strength. He doesn't want your resolve. He doesn't need your character and integrity and, and your hard effort. He wants you to rest in him and let him be the strength the strong, never-ending strength of your life. You see, sometimes the Lord calms the storm, and sometimes he lets the storm rage, and he calms his child. But through it all, he is the strength of our life. There's a traveler on a lonely road. He was hindered by bandits, robbers. They took everything he had, this poor traveler, and they put his hands around a rope and made him grasp this rope and then picked the rope off the ground and said, listen, you're, you are over a precipice. And they blindfolded him. And the minute you let go, you're going to fall to your death. And they rode off. The traveler was aching, hands getting sweaty. Gradually just kept on reaching for one more just to hold on one more minute. Ten seconds. Now after what seemed like eternity, his shoulders were aching, his arms were failing, he knew that he was resigned to die, and he let go. And promptly fell six inches to the ground, where the robbers had used a dirty, rotten lie to escape. My friend's fear in our life is a dirty, rotten lie. Dirty, rotten lie. You can't do that, you will fail. God's more than enough strength. You can't do that. God will fail you. God is more than enough strength. You can't overcome that. God, listen, God is enough strength, and he strengthened my fear. Number two. Look at verse number two and three, please. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, uh, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Sometimes we need strength in our fear. Sometimes we need strength against foes. Some opposition. Could be a person. It could be a culture. It could be an institution. Here David talks about real foes, real enemies that were set out, determined to destroy him, to ruin his kingdom. We do have a foe, his name is the devil, and he's out to destroy us. He doesn't play freeze tag. He's an assassin, hoping to devour us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And my friends, the devil is real, and he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your walk with God. He wants to destroy your relationship with your parents or with your spouse or with your friends or with your co-workers. He's not trying just to hinder and discourage. He wants you not just to succeed. He wants you to suffer and to fall and to be miserable and depressed and to failure. That's the devil that we're facing. He's a roaring lion. He's a foe. But this man, David, a man who is called a man after God's own heart knew that the God of heaven would make everything right. God is more than enough strength against our foes, whether it be the principalities and powers or those we can touch, whether it be the, the, the person close to us or the person far from us. The devil's trying to take down this church. The devil wants to destroy this church. Not because we have a nice building or not because our offerings are, 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 are flush. Not because we have people come to church, but because we have people touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just like a lion, he'll go after the stragglers. But he'll go after everybody. Let him that standeth take heed, lest he fall. We have a real foe. And, and the Bible says God is more than enough strength. Young person in school tomorrow, God can help you get through it. 
Maybe a classmate that you can't stand. They can't stand you. Maybe teachers are against you. Maybe I'm against you. Johnny. Maybe you feel like the whole world's against you. God is more than enough strength. He's better than a weekend. He's better than a vacation home. He's better than a boat. He's better than a raise. He is the king of kings, and he is all the strength we need. Last night, there's one more opposition that we see. Look at verse number 10. We see strength when we're forsaken. David says this, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Now, we don't have any knowledge, any data that, that David's parents have rejected him. In fact, we have some data to the contrary to that. I think David is making a point here, saying that sometimes it's not just fear. Sometimes it's not just the foes. Sometimes it's those who are closest to us and will do things that will hurt the worst. And God is still more than enough strength. In every part of life, God is more than enough when the attacks come from within, God is enough strength. Here's the key. Look in verse 14. We're going to find the strength of God again. We're going to find the key to this. Where David says this. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall what? Strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, what does David mean to wait here? Does it mean that we sit down and, oh, man, just waiting on God? No, no, this word wait here is so much more in this concept. A word that I think would help us with this word would be anticipation. Or remember back when you were five and six. And it's Christmas Eve. And tomorrow, tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow's coming. And it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a great day. There's no school. No more books. It's going to be presents. There's going to be food. There's going to be some family time. It's going to be a good day. That is the idea of waiting on the Lord. In just a minute, God is going to show up. In just a minute, God is going to do something that is going to be so divine. I can't wait to see what he will do. I am happy to anticipate. Wait on the Lord. Sometimes we wait, uh, just waiting on God to do something. Come on, God. That's not waiting on the Lord. That's not being a good courage. That's not being strengthened by him. Someone who's anticipating God said, listen, listen, God's coming. And he may show up today. He may show up tomorrow. And you know what, Nebuchadnezzar? If he determines that he won't rescue us from the fire. Know this, that we will still not bow down to your golden idol. Because you know why? We're waiting on him. And they with courage, they with strength, walked into the furnace that was seven times hotter, that killed the strongest men in the country, the best fighters who threw them in. They were dead. And these three boys... With anticipation, overcoming their fear, not being stopped by the opposition, the foe, not being hurt by all the others who were close to them, all the others who had come from, uh, from the same land and had bowed down, not being hindered by that. They walked in that fire, and Jesus showed up. And Jesus showed up. 
You know, the Bible says they walked around that fire, right? As Nebuchadnezzar said, I see four men walking around the furnace. Why were they walking around? You ever think about that? Why, didn't they, well, why were they just sitting down there? Why were they walking around? Were they talking with the Savior? Or were they looking, man, look at this. Well, I never saw the inside of this thing before. Hey, hey, Shadrach, stoke the flame over there a little bit, buddy. Let's get a little hotter. This ain't touching us. Man, still clothed? No, this is great. They took a situation that others were fearful of, and they said, listen, we have a party here because God has showed up. My friends, when God is a strength of your life, it will cause others to be in wonder and amazement. What's going on? How can you travel that path with such grace and strength? <laughs> my friend, it's not my strength. It's not me. It's him. The Lord is the strength of my life. Is the Lord the strength of your life? Or are you the strength of your life? When the going gets tough, do you just double down? Ah, you know what? Just got to apply myself harder this week. Just got to work a little bit more. We'll get through this. We'll be okay. Then you're the strength of your life. And you will fall far short of what you need in life. Ah, you know what? I stop by giving another cup of coffee. My fourth cup today. But I'll make it through. And that's the strength of your life. And it'll fail you. About 9.30 in the morning. But well, can't wait till Saturday. Man, the weekend's coming. Just two more days. Just one more day. And the weekend's the strength of your life. And just like that, the weekend's gone. And Monday morning comes back. Man, just got to call so-and-so. Man, when I talk to them, boy, that's it. When I talk to them, they're going to encourage my heart. Then that friend is the strength of your life. And there are times when your friends will let you down and forsake you. But my friends, God is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. God will never leave us nor forsake us. Who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to be the strength of your life. The question is, is he the strength of your life? Or is he not even part of your life and it's Red Bull or coffee? Or is he just the strength in your problems? Tonight, let's go back to making the Lord the strength of our life. Eagerly anticipating he's going to show up. And when he does, I don't know exactly what he will do. Sometimes he has a way of surprising us. But it'll be good. It'll be right. And he'll solve the problem. 